Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to talk about a thing called cutter flex. And this isn't something that you would normally think of when you're holding an end mill because you look at an end mill and you say, there's no way that's going to flex. If you try to flex it, it's going to break. Well, the reason it doesn't break is because it flexes. Now, this is especially true with the carbide mentality. When you see a cut that looks a little bit difficult, you say, I'm going to jump the carbide because it's nice and hard, it's not going to flex. Well, so a couple things are going to happen. And let me see if I can detail a few things. And I will almost guarantee that some of the characteristics of the slot that I'm going to point out have happened to you because it's happened to me and it's probably happened to a bunch of other guys. So here we go. Let's just say just for yucks, the slot is positioned along the x-axis of your machine, left to right. This is, uh, let's use something comfortable that an engineer would come up with. Let's say 318. Okay, it's 318 wide. An inch deep. Now that's when your skin starts to crawl because you're looking at the width versus the length and you say, okay, well, I'm going to use a long cutter. So you go after this with a long cutter and you know you can't take this entire cut at one time because if you do, you're going to snap the cutter off. It's just going to yell and scream and chirp and go bang. So what you do is you run back and forth in this and you take, I don't know, whatever you can push the cutter to. Let's say you take five or six passes. And when you finally get down to the bottom, since you're using a 5 16 cutter because that's what you decided to use, it's the largest one that will fit in there and give you the room to do what you need to do. 312 is 5 16 So now you have three pal on either side for cleanup. Perfect. This is going to work great, right? Wrong. It's not. You're going to get a terrible finish on the inside of that slot. And chances are when you get to the bottom of that groove, if it's a tougher material like the stainless, you're going to drop your gauge block in. You're going to drop your gauge pin in. It's going to go halfway down. It's going to wiggle a little bit. It's going to get stuck at the bottom or it's not going to make it all the way to the bottom. And why is that? Well, because the cutter was flexing. As the cutter was coming into the material, it was loading up against the direction of rotation and it was bending and as it bent it left these little Christmas tree marks in the side of your part even with the three thou cleanup because the cutter flexed more than the three thou. So now you have what you thought was going to be a nice wall finish on the inside. No, you got stripes on the inside of that part. Like, all right, well, terrific. Where did the stripes come from? You check your cutter, you think maybe it's on the wall of the cutter, but it's not on the wall of the cutter because you didn't use the entire wall of the cutter until the very last phase when you took the three thou. Effectively, what you did was the cutter you used, you only used the bottom of that cutter, right there. That's it. You made that entire slot using the bottom of the cutter based on the incremental steps. And then you tried to clean up the walls of that slot using fresh flute here. Fresh, hadn't been used because it's just been following the lead. And then the worn out section at the bottom. So by the time you're done cutting this slot, you have, grossly exaggerated here guys, but you have a slot that looks like this. Okay, and this area right here, has been the working zone on your cutter the entire time. How do you overcome that with the same cutter? You don't. What you need to do is you need to put another cutter in there and you need to say, okay, one roughing cutter, one finish cutter. Not an unusual thing to do on a CNC and that mentality should carry over to the manual as well. Christmas tree. How do you get rid of the Christmas tree or the stripes? If you are running down your cut, across your part, down in your cut, back, down in your cut, back, which is the way a CNC would do it. I mean, there are other ways to do this. I know you guys are going to say peck at it and clean it up, but it's not what this is about. If you're doing that, the cutter will always flex to the side closest to you. Let me see if I can explain that a little bit better. Let's say here's your end mill. Right hand cut, right hand spiral, 
99% of the world uses the same kind of cutter, whether it's a two flute or what. It's a right hand spiral, clockwise rotation, that's the way it's going to be. As the cutter is approaching the part, we're looking at the end of the block on the x-axis, as the cutter is approaching the part, which way is the outside of that cutter spinning? Which way is it going to go? If you were to push a wooden valve against it or something, it's going to kick it out. That's the direction that it's going to go. That's the direction it's going to flex. Because as the load comes around to the material and hits the material, it's still going to go before it starts to shave. So the side closest to you is the direction indicator for which way the cutter is going to flex. If you have a slot that you absolutely can't use a smaller cutter on and you must use something that's close, instead of positioning your cutter over the center of that slot, like most of us would do, leaving the equal amount on either side, realize that it's going to flex heavy to one direction and keep this in your thoughts as you are making that cut. If you have six foul total that you get to play with, well, I tell you what, leave one or two on this side and leave the majority on the back side if you're coming across this way. That way it flexes to the long side. Do not move it on the way back. Just come straight back, drop it down again, make another cut. And you can very possibly eliminate these ugly serrations on the wall of the channel. Now getting the taper out of the bottom, you know, use as much of the cutter as you can get away with. And this area right here should reduce only because you reduced the number of cuts it took to do that slot. So the serrations, if you can cheat and you can offset to the side of the flex, I'm going to, I have a wooden dowel out in the machine out there. I'm going to walk out there in a second and, and show you exactly what I'm talking about in case this isn't really clear on the board. But if this has happened to you, if you've had serrations or scuff marks in the wall of a channel that you thought, leave it in the comment line because I want to know how many of you have gone through this. I know I've gone through it. There's no question in my mind. The other thing that can happen when you're doing this, and it depends on the size of the cutter and the length of the cut and a hundred other variables, is by the time that you're done, the wall thicknesses here and here are out of parallel. They're not parallel anymore. If this is against a hard jaw in your vise, you've been running fine, your dial didn't move, why is it not parallel? If you have a digital readout, you would know why, but if you don't have a DRO in your machine, it's not something that you can see. So. That's a, that's a lesson for another day. That's about machine rigidity and uh, machines walking. Cutters walk, machines walk. So let's take a look at the animation or the setup on the mill and uh, plant the seed a little deeper. For sake of this demonstration, let's just assume that the slot that I have drawn on the material in the vise is only five thousandths of an inch larger in width per side than the cutter that's there. You know the slot is too deep to take with one bite, so you're going to nibble away at it. This is a right-hand spiral, right-hand cut end mill. Now I've taken the liberty of drawing some arrows on this. If you're wondering which way this cutter is going to deflect, bend, walk, or move when it cuts into that material, well, this is the side that's going to tell you that. As it's coming around, you can see the rotation because that's the way it's spinning. Just imagine that there's little arrows on it because that's exactly where it's going to go. When this end mill hits this material, it's going to go this way. It is going to pull to that side because of the load. As the cutter gets dull, it's going to get worse. Now you see how the tip of the end mill, it's not going to be a straight parallel cut when it does that. It's going to be a tapered cut. You can see that I'm cutting into the line at the very bottom of the end mill and I'm not even cutting the line at the top. That's why you're going to get that little Christmas tree serration that runs down one wall or both walls of your part. The easiest way to overcome that, instead of setting your tool or your edge finder against the back and moving to the center of the slot and taking finish passes that consume equal amounts of material. Whoop, I just kicked the camera. Sorry about that guys. So instead of taking finishing passes that consume equal amounts of material on the back, 
and the front, the normal idea or, or mentality is to set the tool in the center and take, take equal sides, but don't. If you're going to cut completely from one side, which is the recommended when the cutter is almost the same size as the slot, cheat the cutter to the weak side, positioned like this. That way when it flexes, it flexes into material that's ultimately going to be removed. So if you have 10 thou total that you need to take out after the diameter is consumed, take two in the back and eight in the front. Let that flex move into material that will ultimately be removed and you can control it. As a habit, I do not position my cutters in the center of the slot when I know which side of the table I'm going to be cutting from. Now in order for this to work, you have to cut from one side exclusively. So take the cut, run the cut all the way through the block. You can lift out and return to the original side or you can stay in the trough and come back and you'll see it. On your way back it's going to take a second cut. You're going to say, well how did it do that? Well, that's how it did it. You left a little wedge of material down here in the bottom in the slot and when the cutter relaxes because there's no load, it's going to flex back into that wedge and that's what you're going to see flying when you come back the other way. That's a good tip guys. That's a very solid tip and it served me well over the years. So if you're getting those little stair step serrations even after you make your offset for your final cut, that's why. And when you can, use a fresh cutter for the finish pass because as you nibble away at the depth of this trough, this channel, you're only using however much of this end mill you feed per cut. Everything else is just a follower until you make the final offset left or right, front or rear. I hope that helps. Cutters do flex, they flex quite a bit and with a little preparation and a little understanding of the environment you can avoid nasty pieces. Thanks for watching.